All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our October edition of Webinar Wednesday. Today, we will be talking about 100% outside air VRV systems, a sustainable hybrid approach for superior IEQ. And as always, we have our esteemed professor, Dan Hawney. I am Kelly Huff, and I am the program coordinator for our educational platform and Veritex marketing manager. The QR code, if you want to scan it, get caught up on our socials. It goes to our link tree with everything that you need to know to follow us. If you have not seen the news, Veritex Solutions is now a member of Daikin. We're excited to announce that Veritex Solutions is now a member of Daikin Applied, the world's leading air conditioning company. Now Veritech and Daikin <clears throat> will be one organization that delivers engineering services, equipment, selection and startup, controls integration, and systems maintenance and repair. We will continue going forward as the HVAC system solutions provider. As you know, we cover multiple disciplines and we are continuing to shape the future of HVAC. I won't read our mission and we show this every time, but you guys know that we have a mission and it's to educate the industry. We do that by having monthly webinar Wednesdays. We have two left this year obviously today's, and then our last one will be November, and we will take a break for December and January. Along the same lines of education, we do send out a monthly newsletter with various topics that you should read each month. Uh, this month, we strayed a little from those topics because we had so many events we wanted to tell you about, but we'll get back to the educational side of it next month. And Dan has a bunch of um, AIA credited presentations as well that you can see right there in the middle of the screen. So as you saw, I am recording this. All of the recordings and the PowerPoint presentations are located on our website and our YouTube channel. And you can find it by going to our main home screen, hitting training and going down to the educational resource library. I did mention we have a lot of events coming up. So we're excited that the Dyke and Roadshow comes through every three years. So this is our year, it's making a stop in all four of our offices. You can see the dates there. We do have Albuquerque and El Paso uh, registrations open up as they are a month away now. Uh, so if you have not seen this and you are interested, just send me a little message and I'll make sure that the invite comes your way. And we do have a full lineup of educational um, sessions that are PDH credited and also uh, a lot of fun in store. And then next week in our Tucson and our Phoenix offices, we have humidification design for engineers. These are an in-person training in the morning, and uh, you'll learn all about picking the right size equipment for the humidifiers, the right product, installation considerations, and you can earn three PDH credits for the presentations. So if you are interested and you have not seen the invite, again, send me a message. Before I get into introducing Dan, I just wanted some housekeeping notes real quick. Um, as I mentioned, I'm recording this. You can find it. Um, I will share the link afterwards along with a link to PDH credits. Um, if you do need a PDH, please make sure that your name that you're signed in with here is something that I can identify you by so that I can match you up with your attendance and make sure you get your credits. If you do have any questions throughout the webinar, you can go ahead and place them in the chat and then we will cover them at the end. Dan Hani is our professor for the day. He has almost 40 years of experience in the industry, um, having a lot of educational background in various disciplines. And then he has a lot of experience at various rep firms in the Valley um, that has given him a great understanding of systems, solutions, and high performance buildings. So with that, Dan, I will hand it over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Kelly, and uh, also uh, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, I'm very pleased by uh, a recent development this year in 2024, in July of 2024, ASHRAE selected my nomination to be a distinguished lecturer, so uh, I'm looking forward to my op uh, to the opportunities in the future to be presenting in other, to a other ASHRAE chapters around the country for that, so very pleased about that. Today's presentation, however, is on a high performance system design concept 
Uh, 100% outside air variable refrigerant systems for a sustainable hybrid approach for superior indoor environmental quality. Again, my name is Dan Hani, and thank you today for joining us for another edition of Webinar Wednesday. Today, we're going to be looking at 100% outside air variable refrigerant. Before we do that, I, I think it's very important that context be offered to various system concepts. And I hope to achieve that in today's presentation, certainly at the beginning of today's presentation, by reviewing the pandemic and air quality standards and what ASHRAE, the CDC, and the EPA have stated during the last few years since the pandemic and the growing national focus towards achieving better indoor air quality. We're going to look at indoor environmental quality, decarbonization, and net zero, and the consequent dilemma of MEP system designs that can embrace all of those initiatives. And then a system that can span the divine between indoor environmental quality and meet the needs of decarbonization through the use of 100% outside air systems. Specifically, we're speaking about variable refrigerant and volume technology. And uh, we're gonna look at a design concept where 100% outside air provides all the ventilation air parallel to the variable refrigerant system and review what advantages are inherent in that design concept. Then we're gonna take three outdoor air conditioning uh, uh, scenarios for a 28,000 square foot medical office building to demonstrate how, you, how a system efficiency can be enhanced and better indoor air quality can be achieved by decoupling the outside air from the variable refrigerant component. Then we're gonna look at equipment first costs and paybacks and then of course we'll conclude the session before beginning though i have to really thank a number of supporting individuals who made this all come together uh, eric martin pe for smith group um, stephen zhang of smith group then now currently with stantec chris so a vrv product engineer for daikin judy peters energy modeler for uh, daikin who uh, has since retired um, uh, sad to say, she was just uh, just an elegant person. Um, Zach Niemeyer, Veritech sales engineer, and Austin Vetter, who supported the project by coming up with the variable refrigerant design, evaluated towards the uh, end of this session. So uh, let's begin. Let's look at the pandemic and air quality, ASHRAE, the CDC, and the EPA statements on both topics. First of all, I want to walk back in time to give some sense of history to this whole presentation. We're going to look at ASHRAE's April 5th newsletter announcement of 2021 that acknowledged categorically that airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is a serious concern and the operation of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems can reduce airborne exposures. And one of the recommendations for doing that in ASHRAE's epidemic task force was to say, increase the outside air fractured rate design levels up to 100%. The Center for Disease Control, the CDC, advocated as well uh, for increasing ventilation air within a building. That is to say, the amount of outside air to reduce the risk of aerosolized inhalation of active agents or pathogens that result in infection. The EPA regarding indoor air pollutants has taken a more aggressive stance over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and it is advocating <coughs> to reduce the amount of indoor air pollutants uh, within a, in a building, increase the amount of ventilation air to a building. Now let's be cautious because the EPA's understanding of ventilation air is outside air. That is not ASHRAE standard 62.1's definition of ventilation air to the zone. It is a combination of outside air and properly treated return air. So when the EPA says ventilation air, they're talking about outside air. And it goes on to say that ensuring proper ventilation with outside air can help reduce the concentration of airborne contaminants and of course, viruses indoors. Uh, the EPA also went on, goes on to um, state that in their Clean Air and Buildings Challenge initiative, 
uh, to optimize fresh air ventilation, to improve indoor air quality, and to reduce the concentration of contaminants in the air. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of the ways to do that is to increase the volume of clean outdoor air at, uh, uh, at times of higher risk, especially during pandemic. And there's a whole other issue developing here with ASHRAE's recent standard 241 that uh, considers outside air as one of the adequate ways of providing clean air to the breathing zone during pandemic mode. But um, so anyway, there's some developments on that end with ASHRAE in um, uh, looking at outside air. So stay tuned for that. Well, <clears throat> that begs the question, uh, do we want to bring in a lot of outside air into a building, especially if you're in, living in an area of downtown Phoenix or working in downtown Phoenix and we have the air pollution that we have and cold winter mornings uh, and, and whatever? Well, I found this uh, uh, statement by the EPA rather interesting. Um, the EPA studies have shown that human exposure to air pollutants indicate that indoor levels of pollutants may be two to five times up to 100 times greater than the outdoor air levels. Um, so uh, that's an interesting observation. And there's also another initiative occurring within ASHRAE examining, well, do we, should we need to reevaluate what our CO2 concentrations are in the built environment? Is 700 parts per million greater than the ambient CO2 concentration adequate to maintain human resiliency within the space? Well, ASHRAE is looking at uh, maybe limiting that value to 1,000 parts per million. And there's uh, discussions out there and research being done that is suggesting, well, maybe CO2 concentrations in buildings need to be adjusted to 6,800 parts per million. Well, how do you control CO2 in a building? Bring in outside air. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> with regard to indoor air versus outdoor air pollution, what is a better condition to be exposed to? Be aware that uh, we do, of course, have outdoor air pollutants that are being monitored uh, 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 according to national standards, EPA standards. However, Remember that we actually breathe more outdoor air indoors in the 90% of our lives that we're indoors than we do outdoors. That was the recent studies that were brought forward in a book that I've read recently by Dr. Peter Allen and Dr. John McCumbert of Harvard uh, that demonstrate that um, we actually breathe more outside air in the 90% of our lives living indoors than outdoor airs. Plus, all the off-gassing contaminants that occur within an enclosed space, such as asbestos, biological pollutants, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, wood products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So indoor air quality is considered to be not as good as outdoor air quality, perhaps maybe even in Phoenix, Arizona on a February morning. The White House as well has embraced the idea of a national agenda to address indoor air quality, and it launched its first IAQ summit, October 11, 2022. And it did so to bring together a, a deeper awareness of the public health concern about indoor air quality, and specifically then to address the potential threat of COVID-19 propagation and, uh, and encourage businesses and organizations around the country to take up their clean air and buildings challenge that was launched at that time. But the reason why I bring it up is that of the four commitments building owners would have to comply with to uh, participate in the challenge is commitment to optimize fresh air ventilation. So though that is certainly one uh, uh, agenda that is going on within our built environment industry that uh, is occurring, how to create better indoor air quality. Well, there's another uh, challenge coming into our built environment, and that is ind indoor environmental quality, net zero, and decarbonization initiatives. And it brings about a dilemma. First of all, what is indoor environmental quality? We're aware of what indoor air quality is. It's a measure of contaminants within the environment. But how does that environment impact personal health and well-being of building occupants? 
The USGBC defines indoor environmental quality as encompassing the conditions inside a building, air quality, lighting, thermal conditions, ergonomics, and their effects on occupants and residents. So indoor environmental quality looks at the whole environment and whether or not it is conducive to supporting good human health. The EPA in 2010 <clears throat> is not new to this initiative. They actually began uh, uh, their program on indoor environmental quality back in 2010 by, uh, uh, by establishing a program to assess the indoor environmental effects of various building materials and products. There are other organizations addressing indoor environmental quality like the IEQ Global Alliance, the whole building design guide, and what they have to say in demonstrating that indoor air quality can actually impact human productivity within offices. There's Dr. Stephanie Taylor's good work at, with her organization, Building for Health, that not only uses air measuring technology to uh, monitor up to 12 contaminant levels within a space, it actually runs the calculations that depending on the discrete percentages of which contaminant makes up a composition, <coughs> her program will generate a building health score and uh, address uh, whether or not that environment is conducive to good health or not by issuing an actual number to those discrete levels of contaminant concentrations. So let's look at decarbonization and net zero initiatives, the other side of the coin, the other initiative going on within the nation. We have the AIA 2030 commitment towards decarbonization. It goes on to say the built environment creates a staggering 40% of the world's CO2 emissions. And consequently, the AIA has a firm commitment to create net zero carbon emissions buildings by 2030. And that's both for operational and embedded carbon. The Carbon Leadership Forum uh, is in existence as well, looking to obtain operational carbon net zero by 2030 and embodied carbon by 2040. Um, the Department of Energy has issued the determination in 2024 that ASHRAE standard 90.1 2022 is the standard that defines building efficiency levels that need to be maintained. And, and, and that language needs to be written into municipality codes within the next two years. At least that's the determination and directive. Why did they do that? Well, uh, it's really rather surprising. The 2022 90.1 edition adds another 9.8% building efficiency above the 2019 level that added 4.7% more efficiency to the 2016 edition of 90.1. So you can see where ASHRAE is going and it's interesting how the Department of Energy has embraced ASHRAE as the defining building performance metrics. So that begs the question, what type of HVAC systems are conducive for good decarbonization uh, results and effects in moving towards all electric buildings? There was a very good article in the September 2021 edition of the ASHRAE Journal, How Building Decarbonization Can Transform HVAC. And it goes on to say that, again, buildings in the U.S. account for 40% of carbon emissions. And by the way, of that 40% of the buildings, 40% of a building's emissions is related to the MEP system. So be aware of that. Almost 50% is due to the mechanical system. So one solution to help reduce carbon emissions, according to Peter Rumsey, is to look at all electric buildings by using heat pump technology, specifically variable refrigerant flow technology. And he goes on to write that dedicated outdoor air systems and their associated benefits couple well with VRF systems. Well, on the other side of the coin, going back to air quality, how do we improve building air quality? ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force gave tremendous guidelines for reducing the risk of infection but all of them mean adaptations of HVAC systems that add energy cost and the operational cost of a building by increasing minimum filtration levels to MERV 13, ideally MERV 14, 
Um, if not, perhaps HEPA filtration, which is unrealistic for most commercial applications. Also, it goes on to state, increase outside air fraction rates, as well as maintain building humidity between 40 to, 6 per, 40 to 60 percent. That demands a whole other presentation, which I have and I built. Uh, we won't go into it today. So all of these solutions in, uh, increase the energy requirements and energy consumption costs of a building's performance. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. Uh, these challenge, this challenge and this dilemma inspired me to examine 100% outside a variable refrigerant system to demonstrate that good indoor air environmental quality, good indoor air quality, and system efficiency need not be mutually exclusive. And we can achieve more efficient HVAC MEP designs while we're creating better indoor environmental quality, providing we bring the right pieces together in a system solution design. So spanning the divide, let's look at 100% outside air systems and what are 100% outside air systems? 100% outside air system is a decouple from the HVAC system, that is to say in your sensible dehumidification mode of cooling in conventional HVAC systems. We handle the outside air independently and design it parallel to your other VAV, uh, to your other uh, mechanical system, HVAC system in a building. Well, one of the efficiency advantages of a 100% outside air unit is that they are frequently designed with energy recovery that actually uses exhaust air uh, and it's either warmer or cooler condition depending on the season to precondition the outside air without using mechanical force cooling or heating. So 100% outside air systems more often not use energy recovery and they come in two forms sensible energy recovery and enthalpy energy recovery. And when you look at 100% outside air system, you want to make sure that the exhaust airflow rate is below the supply airflow rate to maintain a positive building pressure. So you're not sucking in cold or hot air, depending on your season into a building due to a negative pressure of the building. So in both the exhaust and supply air of your outside air, is brought through a common unit separated by a dividing wall with a heat recovery device, either it's a sensible plate and frame uh, device or an enthalpy recovery wheel. And there is even enthalpy plate and frame recovery devices available today that are very compelling. So <clears throat> why do we want, again, to bring energy recovery into a 100% outside air system that's decoupled from the uh, HVAC system? Well, for improved energy efficiency, because you have free preconditioning of the outside air and either cooling or heating. And for 100% outside air variable refrigerant systems, your variable refrigerant system can be substantially downsized and become more efficient. Uh, one of the advantages of decoupling the outside air from the mechanical system is you can actually bring the outside air directly into each zone and it's measurable, it's verifiable. In an all mixed air system, are we sure we're getting the outside air distributed to all the zones in an all air system? Um, well, we presume so uh, that actual adequate mixing occurs at the air handling to distribute percentages uniformly throughout a building. But if you decouple the outside air, you can be assured you're bringing the outside air necessary to each zone. And then you have the opportunity to say whether or not you want to optimize indoor air quality by increasing the outside air flow rate beyond code minimum. So um, that's, so, that's certainly an advantage that a 100% outside air system offers. Also, you can more effectively control your CO2 concentrations by regulating exactly your outside air flow rate to each zone. And if your outside air is properly dehumidified, which is becoming a challenge in conventional designs, then we can control outside air supply air dew point adequately to maintain appropriate humidity levels in a building. So <clears throat> with that said, what, 
is a variable refrigerant volume technology? What is the technology and what is its inherent efficiency advantage? First of all, let's review why we need HVAC systems to begin with. First and foremost, it's to maintain occupant thermal comfort. And what's becoming, we're becoming more aware of over the last 20, 30, 40 years since the um, sick building syndrome of the 1970s is that the mechanical system, the HVAC system can actually contribute to healthier building environments. Um, and one of the things that we need to do it, to do that is to maintain and regulate humidity control. So what is the definition of energy efficiency? The Department of Energy offers this definition. <coughs> Excuse me. Energy efficiency is the use of less energy to perform the same task or work or produce the same result. It's interesting that ASHRAE's standard 189.1 high performance building standard offers uh, a pretty interesting definition to high performance green building. It is a building design constructed and capable of being operated in a manner that increases environmental performance and economic value over time. So the high performance building standard ASHRAE has written doesn't only address energy efficiency, it's looking at a building's environmental performance. And why would we not want that? Since we spend 90% of our lives in a building, why would we not want a healthy environment? And I'm confident we've all experienced walking into buildings where you just didn't feel well, or you go into a conference room that's fully packed with people. And the first thing you want to do is sort of close your eyes and go to sleep, right? Well, have you considered CO2 levels in the room? What is there? What are their levels at? It has been demonstrated that human occupants can begin to have negative adverse uh, uh, responses to CO2 levels in the realm of 1,000 parts per million. So uh, again, it depends on the individual, it depends on their physiology, state of health, et cetera, but uh, CO2 is becoming more and more of a concern. Well, to maintain thermal comfort, HVAC systems cool and dehumidify buildings by fundamentally moving energy. That's what we do in the mechanical industry. We are energy movers. We move sensible and latent energy. In heating mode, we actually add energy to a building that is being lost through perimeter walls to colder ambient conditions. Conventional HVAC systems accomplish this by using air as a heat transfer medium. We flood the building with a lot of air to capture the energy gain in the building and to take it back to an air handler where we remove that energy through a cooling coil or add energy through a heating coil uh, to maintain building space conditions. The problem is, is that air is not a very dense heat transfer medium. So it requires a lot of air to move the energy necessary to condition a building, which means horsepower. Well, our friends at Daikin Comfort provided this wonderful graphic uh, in their variable refrigerant um, presentation that demonstrate the advantage of reconsidering your heat transfer medium local to each zone. And an all air system, again, to repeat, air is the heat transfer medium. Uh, we need something, we need some fluid to move the energy gain or overcome the energy loss in a building. Air is effective, but it's not a very good solution for energy efficiency. Why? Air can only hold 0.46 BTUs per pound of air because it is not very dense. So why are we looking at alternative ways of uh, 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 moving energy in a building uh, to create more efficient buildings? Well, let's look at water. What if we could use water as a heat transfer medium <clears throat> throughout a building, locally to each zone, as opposed to relying on all air systems? Well, it could make sense because water is a more dense heat transfer medium. It can hold 8.98 BTUs per pound of water than air. Uh, uh, so substantially more energy, which means you can move the same amount of energy as air 
with a lot less water and consequently the horsepower required to drive the water through a building using pumps is less than the fan horsepower necessary to move air throughout a building in an all air system. Well, there is another heat transfer medium, refrigerant. Refrigerant is an even more dense heat transfer medium, and it can move 88.2 BTUs per pound of refrigerant. Consequently, you can move even that much more energy with refrigerant. So if you can bring refrigerant locally to each zone in the building, and have that refrigerant absorb the energy gain within the spaces, you can move that energy out of a building more efficiency than conceptually than water, but that begs some evaluation, but certainly more so than air. So what is variable refrigerant volume? What is this technology, otherwise known with the popular acronym VRF? What is it? Well, <clears throat> instead of an all air system that has a big air handler on the roof that pumps air throughout the building through large ductwork and it returns building air back to the air handler for it to be conditioned at the coil. We actually bring fan coils, distribute them throughout the building locally, potentially to each zone or using ducted units to serve a discrete number of zones and then actually move the sensible and latent heat energy at these fan coil units served by a condenser remote from that air handler. So, you're actually bringing that refrigerant locally to each zone. And variable refrigerant technology uses variable speed scroll compressor technology to modulate refrigerant flow throughout the building depending on demand. By modulating ref refrigerant flow dependent on demand, you end the energy consuming process of on, off, start, stop cycling. Many of you in your homes who have air conditioners are fully aware, certainly during the summer, when your AC unit fan kicks on and off, on and off, and your compressors turn on and off and on and off. Well, that end surge of energy necessary to overcome the inertia of a stop mode is significant and it's very inefficient. And we want to do this locally at each zone, as I mentioned earlier, because refrigerant is a more dense heat transfer medium than air, and by modulating refrigerant flow, we allow the energy demand <clears throat> to really drive the system performance. How much land, uh, how much demand there is, or how much load or sensible and latent uh, energy needs to be moved is uh, addressed by the variable refrigerant system that modulates refrigerant flow dependent on that demand. So your system is not being overworked uh, uh, as we would see on a on off start stop cycling process. So to give a better graphic, let's look at variable refrigerant flow uh, and how, how it actually works. And you can see that there are two types of variable refrigerant technologies. There's a heat pump technology that allows for either heating or cooling mode from a discrete condenser. So depending on the mode of that zone, cooling or heating, refrigerant flow modulates to the air handlers depending on the demand local to each zone. Compressors do not start stop cycle on and off. They continually modulate to move that refrigerant a more efficient approach to that technology is a heat recovery technology. Uh, our manufacturer, Daikin, uses a three-pipe system where you can provide simultaneous heating and cooling off of a common condenser. Uh, that adds a layer of efficiency because you're actually distributing heat energy in the refrigerant itself to the appropriate zone depending on the demand without having to deliver it all the way back to the condensing unit, which requires energy to do so. So <clears throat> supplying that refrigerant locally to each zone, we bring uh, refrigerant to the evaporator coils in discrete cassettes, either in each zone through ceiling and wall cassettes, or we can provide ducted technologies that are, uh, are uh, ducted to two or three zones to a variable refrigerant fan coil. And in most conventional system, we handle the latent and sensible cooling and heating requirements at these fan coil units. 
But <clears throat> that begs the question, certainly in Phoenix, Arizona, what about the outside air? We have to bring a minimum of outside air to a building to conform with ASHRAE standard 62.1, which defines the minimum ventilation rates required at each zone depending on that zone's usage and building application. Well, a conventional approach to outside air is duct, uh, uh, run an outside air duct to a louver uh, on a wall or to an intake hood on the roof and just draw the outside air through the negative pressure generated by a return duct to the fan coil units and hope you get the right outside air to each fan coil as necessary. But in doing this, that means that the variable refrigerant fan coil is seeing the total load of the building, not only of the building, but also in the outside air. So uh, that's a lot of load to put on a refrigerant fan coil unit. Well, when in Phoenix, Arizona, which is what this article was about and which this presentation is about, what about the Sonoran Desert? We often associate our peak summer design condition in June, 115 degrees. Well, when it's 115 degrees, it's actually dry. Our peak summer design day, where the total enthalpy energy in the environment is actually greater when it's 97 degrees dry bulb, 78 degrees wet bulb, or at a 71 degree dew point versus 115 degree design day at a 49 degree dew point. So our peak summer design condition is monsoon, which we see anywhere from the beginning of July right the way through mid-September, we've seen it. <coughs> so a conventional way of designing variable refrigerant is to provide a um, um, untempered outside air to the VRV system and then design to the peak load, to the peak summer design condition. And we have to realize that the dehumidification would then occur at the variable refrigerant fan coil unit as well. And if it's doing its job, and it can, it will be filling drain pans with water at the fan coil units within the space. So the problem is, is that uh, when these units operated at peak load and at max load, they're no more efficient than a high sear package rooftop unit. So we're not getting the full advantage of a variable refrigerant system when we have unconditioned outside air. Uh, and the outside air is being co-treated with the return air to each zone. So <clears throat> when you design a variable refrigerant system with untempered outside air, you have a higher outside air condition temperature, which means you have a higher mixed air condition at your fan coil cooling coil. That higher load at the fan coil means that condensers have to be oversized to meet the peak demand. Well, the problem is, is that when you design around larger condensers, you have re reduced turndown. And this, it is during turndown that variable flow technologies offer their greatest advantage when you're at part load. Reduced turndown means reduced efficiency. And consequently, the owner has pays a uh, uh, operating cost higher than throughout the life cycle of the building than a more efficient design approach with variable refrigerant technology. So another problem is, is that if you design the VR variable refrigerant system with untempered outside air, you're, uh, you're designing to your peak summer design condition. Well, for Phoenix, Arizona, we see that 110 degrees, only 0.4% of our annualized hours. Oh, and by the way, we see 115 degrees and we're topping out at 120. So um, it begs the question that we're oversizing the mechanical system to handle these peak design conditions, which mean that the variable refrigerant system is not offering its efficiency at part load conditions. So is there a better way to design variable refrigerant systems? And by the way, again, Peter Rumsey suggests that there is. What about a 100% outside air variable refrigerant hybrid approach to decouple the outside air from the VRV system? So uh, in this concept, we actually handle all of the outside air with a 100% outside air unit we use energy recovery for the most part to precondition the outside air 
uh, before it even hits the 100% outside air unit cooling coil. And then we distribute that outside air locally and directly to each zone. So <clears throat> this way, if you properly control your outside air humidity levels, you can offer better humidity control with a variable refrigerant system because your supply air can be designed to a dew point that will absorb the humidity gain in a building during our wettest times of years, July, August through mid-September. And you can provide load neutral air using hot gas reheat from a DX compressor and a DX 100% outside air unit. By doing this, you reduce the variable refrigerant system load. In fact, the technology of our manufacturer will allow you to put a variable refrigerant coil in the 100% outside air unit to ride the outside air demand with varying modulating refrigerant flow as well. So it's a very attractive solution. And by doing this, we can reduce the latent load at the VRV fan coil units and reduce the mixed air temperature at the cooling coil of those fan coil units. So <clears throat> looking at um, a decoupled outside air approach to VRV, the outside air is parallel to the VRV system. Outside air is de delivered directly to each zone. Heat recovery is used in the DOASH unit to, for free pre-cooling of outside air, so coils are not seeing uh, a mixed air condition of the mid to upper 80s. We have hot gas reheat coil technology with DX DOASH technology, so we can provide free reheat to the supply air properly conditioned at the cooling coil by using the heat of rejection from compressors to post heat the air as it comes off the coil. So from an overall design approach and its advantage, what are those advantages specifically? Well, we can provide outside air condition to load neutral condition, 70 to 75 degrees, whatever you want by using hot gas reheat. We can lower cooling coil, fan coil entering air temperatures because the fan coil is now only seeing the temperature of the return air to the building, not a mixed air condition of the return with the outside air. Lower load on the fan coils means lower condenser tonnage and consequently lower VRV first cost savings. Well, if you reduce the condenser tonnage, your system is more efficient at turndown and you have improved condenser efficiency. Smaller variable refrigerant mechanical dimensional footprint for your architects to take advantage of. And these systems run parallel, uh, they're outside air parallel to the variable refrigerant system, assuring and validating the outside air is being distributed throughout the building as is necessary depending on zone usage. And if you properly dehumidify the outside air at the DOAS unit, you can provide depressed dew point supply air that adds another layer of efficiency that our research demonstrates that we'll speak to here shortly. So what is a 100% outside air variable refrigerant concept, a project review? Well, uh, to do this, uh, I worked with uh, my friends at Smith Group, uh, Eric Martin and Steven Zag. And they, um, we wanted to look at VRV for small to medium sized buildings. We so often associate high performance buildings with large institutional structures, 100,000 square feet, 150,000 square feet. But what about the small and mid sized buildings? What type of advantage would a 100% outside air variable refrigerant system offer to smaller building owners? So Smith Group was kind enough to uh, give us a project that they were working on. Uh, it was a 28,000 square foot medical office building. Uh, we laid out systems using our elevation of 1,100 feet and uh, <coughs> used the same building design layout and load calcs for all three design scenarios that I'm going to speak to. <clears throat> so in making the evaluation of conventional untempered outside air serving a variable refrigerant system, we designate as design one and we use an outdoor air condition of 97, 78 degrees monsoon, our peak summer design condition. We look at a building air condition of 75 degrees at 50% RH, which we could achieve certainly in our monsoon months, and a winter condition of 38 degrees. 
Design two, we actually used 100% outside air solution, um, providing uh, a dough ash unit that is parallel to the variable refrigerant system. But we look carefully at dew point control by providing a standard 55 degree air condition off the coil at 54 degree wet bulb, resulting in a supply air dew point of 53.3 degrees. Design system three, we designed with a low dew point DOAS supply air decision. And we're gonna to speak to our rather surprised findings on what that meant to the actual system. So if we look at uh, system design concept two with 100% outside air unit, beware that we used a hot gas reheat coil to elevate the leaving air condition out of the unit to 70 degrees or load neutral. Uh, and then, uh, uh, but if you look at the dew point, the dew point remains at 53.3 because we're only adding sensible heat energy to the air coming off the cooling coil to bring us to load neutral condition. In design three, we did the same thing, but look at the dew point because we actually provided air at 52 degrees, 50 degrees wet bulb off the coil. And that was a target temperature that uh, I didn't come up with arbitrarily. It was recommended by uh, uh, our regional sales manager for Dyke and Applied, Jay Eldridge. When I asked him the question before writing the article, what we should target for appropriately designed outside air, Jay said, try 5250, and we did. And uh, that was pretty, pretty revealing in what we found out. So let's look at the actual performance. Now, all of the performance results that we're gonna examine here are based on Daikin's energy modeling software at their time, which was a train trace platform. And they only had their VRV 4X condenser technology performance curve uh, uh, drawn into that platform. Since then, Daikin's new Amerian technology condenser offers another 30% greater efficiency than their series four. So the numbers you're gonna be seeing are very conservative compared to what we can actually achieve now with newer condenser technology. All the room layouts and peak loads for all three design scenarios are the same. Fan coil sizing remain the same. Condenser capacity changed based on the outside air component. And all of this data was based on TMY3 weather data. Uh, by the way, you may be find it interesting that TMY3 weather data ends in 2005 and has not addressed the increasing temperatures that we've seen since then. So just as a note. So <clears throat> let's look at the question of humidity control. Are we adequately controlling building humidity levels by providing 55, 54 degrees off the coil or 53.3 degree dew point. And historically in Phoenix, Arizona, we can say yes. Why are buildings leaked? So we need a lot of air to overcome that 115 degree summer design day, 110 degree design day. And uh, in doing that, we can control the latent uh, component or the humidity component uh, to a room condition of 55 degree dew point, but be aware if you're providing 55 degrees off the coil and you're maintaining a room condition of 75, 50% or H, the supply air only has a 1.8 degree dew point depression, which means that you can dehumidify if you have enough air, but here's the challenge. In high performance buildings, we're tightening up our perimeter walls. We're using better insulation. We're using improved glazing to reduce the radiant load through windows. Our sensible loads are going down, but our humidity loads are not going down. So as we reduce air flows because of our good design practice architecturally, and we're not adjusting for the humidity, we're gonna run into a humidity issue, which results in mold in buildings and other consequent effects um, So we don't wanna see. So uh, this is a question that needs to be brought to the foreground, especially as the AIA is trying to meet their 2030 uh, commitment and decarbonizing buildings through more efficient uh, uh, design strategies. Is 1.8 degree dew point depression, depression adequate? So 
let's look at this actual performance review of the three design scenarios and let's uh, go through them quickly. Well, if we look at the variable refrigerant fan coil selections with untempered outside air, what's rather interesting, the discharge temperature off the cooling coil at the fan coils local to each zone isn't even at 55. It's very hard during a monsoon design day to hit actual condensation. It's not to say that you're not having condensation form. It's a question of whether or not you're adequately controlling humidity in the space. And by the way, when your condensate pans filled with water, uh, that exposed water in a building is contributing to the humidity effect. Um, so um, just be aware of that. Well, if we look at a decoupled 100% outside air solution for variable refrigerant, look at the more relaxed uh, supply air condition off the fan coil units because the outside air component is decoupled from the variable refrigerant uh, uh, fan, uh, fan coil. By using a 100% outside air unit, you're able to use uh, free outside air preconditioning. So your overall tonnage to the building is re reduced and your overall tonnage to the variable refrigerant system is significantly reduced. And these numbers down at the bottom demonstrate that very clearly. With a non-tempered mixed air variable refrigerant design, you're at 105.6 tons. By using a decoupled DOAS with enthalpy energy recovery, we're now down to 74.4 tons because of the free cooling of the outsider at the DOAS unit. You provide even deeper dew point control off the DOAS by increasing the size. We have a little bit more reduction in overall tonnage, and that's because your enthalpy wheel increases with the higher condenser size to provide the lower supply air condition off the cooling coil. So <clears throat> if we look at it objectively, we look at design scenario, you have an actual reduction of 31.2 tons by using a decoupled 100% outside air unit with 55 degrees off the coil or 53 degree, degree dew point, and you reduce the overall nominal tonnage by 40 tons by providing 48.8 degree dew point uh, as opposed to an untempered design. So supplying 48.8 degree dew point on your DOAS system means that, and I'll never forget this conversation with Judy Peters of Daikin when she was running through the results with me. She said, holy cow, Dan, when you provide 48 degree dew point from your DOAS unit, that turns your variable refrigerant system into a sensible cooling only system. See, and, and, which means that really what you have is almost a refrigerant chill bean. Uh, now we don't have drain pans filling up with water adding humidity to a space we're trying to provide humidity control to. We don't have biomass gr uh, growing within the condensate pans. Consequently, you have an element of improved IEQ to a building. What is this actually, how does this actually pencil out with regard to performance? Design number two uh, consumes 19% less energy than the untempered design scenario and the low dew point DOAS design strategy saves 26% more efficiency in Phoenix, Arizona, or in a Sonoran Desert above an untempered design solution. Well, here's the big challenge that we always have. Well, what about equipment first costs and payback? We've got we to make this system affordable. Well, I'll just show you the numbers and you make that decision for yourself. So uh, we went ahead and priced the systems and, uh, and we looked at the uh, uh, untempered outside air design scenario, and we find that the overall equipment cost for the variable refrigerant system where the total sensible and latent load was handled at the fan coil, we had an equipment cost of $239,875. That does not include installation, that does not include copper piping or whatever. This is just surely the, uh, the variable refrigerant manufacturer's equipment. Design considerations. 100% building dehumidification occurs at the VRV fan coil units, larger condenser sizing, larger heavier units, larger mechanical footprints, drain pans filled with condensate, outside air to zones not validated. How do you know that each fan coil is drawing the appropriate amount of outside air to each zone when you're leaving it to a negative pressure component in the return air, outside air reduct system? If we look at design scenario number two, 
total equipment cost was $257,145. Uh, that's a premium of $17,270 with Daikin's projected payback of five to 10 years. But here you have better building humidity control, enhanced system energy efficiency, reduced condensation, and verifiable validated indoor air, uh, outdoor air delivery and supply to each zone. Well, let's look at design scenario number three. Now the equipment co cost does go up a bit because of the larger DOASH unit to achieve 52 degrees at the coil. So your total premium is $26,000 at six to 11 years uh, payback, projected payback, depending on actual building usage. Um, but now you can really control your building humidity level to where it needs to be. Uh, during monsoon, it needs to be 40 to 60%, and you can control that humidity level. You offer premium system efficiency to your variable refrigerant system. You significantly reduce the risk of building condensation, and outdoor air is delivered exactly to each zone and can be validated and monitored for enhanced indoor environmental quality. So to close, let's just review today's session. We looked at the actual dilemma, what the industry has brought forward to our attention during the pandemic, the growing national, if not global movement to, are we adequately addressing indoor air quality, indoor environment quality to protect human health? We looked at statements by the CDC, the EPA, and outside air that are advocating for increased outside air being brought into buildings and zones. And we looked at the challenges of net zero initiatives, the AIA 2030 commitment, the Carbon Leadership Forum, et cetera. And then we demonstrated, I think, certainly 100% outside air system that can span the divide of that dilemma by providing enhanced energy efficiency, better indoor air quality, control building humidity, and provide premium efficiency for decarbonization and electrification, 100% outside air variable refrigerant systems. Are there any questions? We have a question in the chat. Is there really a decrease in total tonnage under the number two out of three scenarios, even though VRV tonnage was reduced what was the tonnage for the DOAS units, particularly the delta between two and three? Uh, the, okay, well, that's an excellent question. The, TOA, uh, the tonnage at the DOAS units uh, is reduced because of energy recovery. Uh, a DOAS unit is a two-tunneled two system with a divider with supply air on one side, exhaust air on another, with a heat, uh, with a heat recovery device that could be either sensible heat energy recovery only or enthalpy that removes not only sensible heat from the outside air, but also the humidity level, a uh, percentage of the humidity. So you reduce the overall load to the building. Otherwise, that load has to be seen at a variable refrigerant fan coil unit. You handle the total load, both the sensible heat load as well as the humidity from the outside air and the humidity gain in the building. So that's why you see the reduced tonnage uh, in those systems is because of the energy recovery option available in these systems. Okay, that was the only question right now. Okay. Oh, another one came in. Sure. Uh, do Daikin VRF systems have proprietary controls? Can our operation operations technicians troubleshoot and fully access all the controllers, all the all trouble warning, etc., without the need to call a Daikin tech? Uh, well, absolutely. In fact, they're all back net compatible and we can put, build that into the system. So, uh, yes, we can do that. And, and what's uh, Ver at Veritech, we offer training on this. So we do it not only for service techs, we also do it for building owner techs or whatever. So we can support in, uh, 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 any maintenance team or tech technical team to access and uh, 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 work with the actual control platform. And we can certainly bring it into a, uh, uh, into a building energy management system through BACnet. Absolutely. We do offer two phases of um, the Daikin service training. Um, we have service and troubleshooting, and then we have installation and operations, inst installation and commissioning. Installation Correct. and commissioning is no. first, and then you can go through the service and troubleshooting. And we hold them in our, we have one in um, Phoenix office and our Tucson office, and in Albuquerque, there's one at the local UA. Um, UA local. 
so definitely, definitely. Well, um, and, and, and it's a way for Veritech to give back to the community that has supported us by offering this training for free. Um, yeah. And we, our, our technical center, our variable refrigerant technical center, has every fan coil manufactured by Daikin. Their accessories represented in condensers, well, our older condenser technology. We haven't installed the Umerion yet um, because we're mo actually moving buildings this year. So, um, but all of that is available in house, operational, wired, controlled, and monitored. So, uh, yes, we are fully kitted out to actually do the training that we spoke to. Yep. And actually, um, our Daikin Roadshow is a great opportunity to see this equipment in person. Um, the Roadshow in Albuquerque will be at the um, UA Local 412, which is where there's the um, newest Daikin training center. And they actually have some R32 condensing units there as well. So um, definitely check out one of those Roadshows. Shameless plug. Uh, another question was connecting the DOAS to the VRF condenser system. Uh, and let's see, hold on, let me reread that. Was it connecting? To... Brian, I'm not sure, I'm not understanding your question. If you want to come off mute and ask it. It was, was a semi-custom DX DOAS unit considered... I, I could I, I'm going to presume maybe I, I understand what he's asking. Okay. <laughs> how, how do we how do we bring the DOAS unit into the variable refrigerant uh, domain? Oh, was it okay? Was it I, separate I think that's system? It, I, Got it. Basically, um, uh, what we do is we provide a dedicated variable refrigerant condenser to a variable refrigerant evaporator coil installed in the DOAS unit, and uh, then we modulate refrigerant flow to that coil depending on the demand. So we, we eliminate start stop cycling of a remote uh, condenser that's just um, enabled or disabled. We can actually ride the load depending on the ambient condition locally to that unit. And of course that condenser would feed into the uh, variable refrigerant control network seamlessly. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, just a quick mention. There were a few people that I um, sent messages to, direct messages, if I couldn't, if I didn't know who you were, if you needed credit for this class. So um, just before you jump off, check your messages and make sure you weren't one of them. Um, and if anybody has any more questions, we'll stick around. Oh, all right. Thanks, Brian. And Dan, you answered his question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Give it a, a few seconds. All right, I just saw uh, somebody needs a PDH. If you can just respond and put your name in the chat because it's coming up with just a number as your name. And if there are any architects participating, we, we can issue an HSWLU yes, credit. Yes, that as well. I got, okay, I got you, Janice. There's just one Thanks. that said, hey, you're welcome. I just, there was one there, the screen name is showing 3320, okay. Got you. Thanks, Eves. Perfect. <laughs> if I can see your name in the chat, then then you're good. Is there there's just some that didn't have their name shown? So Kelly, I'd like to I'd like to add. I know yeah. these presentations are dense. Uh, they're meant mm -hmm. to be dense uh, so that they could be a resource three months from the uh, yes. from now. Uh, we uh, pro upload as Kelly spoke to earlier all the recorded editions to Veritex website, as well as PDF copies of the uh, uh, PowerPoint decks so that you can actually have it available to you in written form. Yes, that is correct. I will just scrub it before I put it up to make sure that we're good to post it onto a public forum. And uh, once I get that, I will send that link out uh, as well as the PDH and any AIA that were requested. Yeah. All right. I think I think we've got all the questions handled. As always, if you do have any questions, you feel free to send me an email, send Dan an email, or if you know who your Veritech salesperson or contact is, you can always reach out to them and we would be happy to help you. Dan, thank you. Hey, and always uh, fantastic job. Thank all of you for joining us today. And if you think of your questions a week from now, don't hesitate to email us. 
All right. Thank you. Have a good week.